Good morning, everybody. We have a tight schedule this morning. We want to get you out to see the tables as soon as we can. And we've got some great presentations for you. So good morning, gardeners and farmers. Good to see everybody here. And please take a seat and we'll get this going. I'm Becky Halby. I'm a proud member of the Arlington Friends of Urban Agriculture. I'm also on the Plot Against Hunger Committee. I'm an extension master gardener and a master naturalist. And I'm very excited about today's event. We're going to learn about the Plot Against Hunger, which started these kickoff events more than a decade ago. And we've developed a long-term partnership with Central Library. So let's give a hand to Central Library for hosting these events. We've got a great lineup of speakers this morning, including Libby Garvey from the Arlington County Board. We've got Mr. Doug Kretemeyer with Arlington's Department of Environmental Services, and he's going to talk about an upcoming rollout of a compost system for multifamily buildings. We have Barbara Hoffheins, John Bell, and Ann Dahl, who are going to talk about an ozone research garden at Walter Reed Community Center. We've got Donnie Nolan with George Mason University's sustainability program and her half acre greenhouse, right? All right. We've got Jennifer Hankins with our feature, and Sandy Newman, <laughs> Newton, sorry, uh, with our featured plot garden. This year it's the Arlington House, and that's in our national cemetery, Arlington National Cemetery. We're going to hear about some opportunities to feed the community from Pete Riley on gleaning and Lila Leichbold on the produce bagging program. And we've got Cassie Ravo here from Randolph Elementary School Pantry to talk about how your donations help out their community. And lastly, we've got Jennifer Hankins again and our own FUA board president, Emily Landsman, who's going to talk about volunteer opportunities and senior experience for high schoolers. So let's get started. If you've registered, I hope you all got your door prize tickets. We have some door prizes up here, including a uh, Plant Nova Natives native plant guide. We've got winter sowing kit that has spinach already growing in it. We've got a pack of 20 seeds, and we've got $25 gift certificates from Botanical Interest, as well as some signed garden books signed by the authors. But wait, there's more. Of course, we've got all the tables and posters in the back. And outside, please give some love to Dave Sachs, who's going to be out there with the tool swap. I hope some of you brought tools. Yes. <laughs> brought some tools to swap. Or if, if you need some, please take a look and, and grab something. We also have some plot gardens represented in the back. And you can get to know them and see if they need your help this, this summer, spring and summer. All right, so the door prizes are going to be at the end, and you need to be present to win. So that's our incentive. So let's get to know a little bit about you. Who here is here at a spring garden kickoff for the very first time? Oh, my goodness. Well, welcome. I hope you learn a lot and get to know some people and get inspired about your spring gardens. So the purpose of our spring garden kickoffs is to get us ready for the gardening season, both educationally with free seeds, coffee grounds, and more. So let's get this started and welcome up our county board member, Libby Garvey, who's here to talk with us about food insecurity and things with the county. Thank you so much, Becky. Although I will say, I was coming over here, and I have no prepared remarks, but I do think a little bit about what I'm going to say. And I thought, you know what? Let's start out asking everybody who's been here, who's here for the first time. <laughs> you just stole my thunder. However, the point was made, which I can tell. So I've been coming from the very beginning. I'm pretty sure, I'm not sure I've made every single one. When it was just a small collection of people, and there wasn't any of this fancy stuff, it was just... Um, really grassroots <laughs> starting from the beginning it is incredible to see how this has grown and in fact when I'm coming over part of it was I want to see how much things have grown and changed in a year and it's huge um, 
For those of you for, the, for whom this is the first time, this is a much bigger deal than it used to be. <laughs> it's great. Um, so yeah, you know, give everybody a hand and Fua and the whole leadership. Yeah. And I won't talk long because I'm just supposed to be, you know, welcoming everybody, and we are delighted to have you here. Um, I found myself so I'm thinking about, you know, coming here to watch how things grow. I said, Libby, that's a pun, you know, and you should really see, you know, you're going to weed out. Libby, that's a pun. Um, the thing is, with agriculture and urban gardening, almost everything is a pun, and I started to think, why? Well, as a species, you know, we've developed at our very core is agriculture. You know, we've always had need depended on growing things from the very beginning, since even before we were human humans. Um, it's so um, important to us as a species. Now, I read a fact, um, and I should have researched if I'd really prepared, I would have checked this out. Um, but it's about 10 years ago, some of you may remember. Um, there was, it, was one, it was kind of a thing that for the first time ever in the history of humanity, more people lived in cities than lived in the country. Think about it, I mean, that's huge, right? That's a huge change. Um, and I think finally, as we've kind of crossed that line, we're realizing, whoa, we're losing something really important to us, which is growing things, and food, and Mother Earth, and agriculture. And so this, I see this as part of an effort and a resurgence to get back to our roots, another, sorry, another pun. <laughs> Um, but it, what, what is happening here, I have always seen as really, really important. It's quiet, people don't see it, it's happening all around. I have a sister and her wife who are totally involved in the, you know, back to the earth and growing from um, native, native plants. Um, this is happening everywhere, it's really exciting and I do think our species survival is gonna depend on it. And particularly if we're gonna live all in cities, we've gotta make cities work for people and we need to be more sustainable and more resilient. And I think urban gardening is absolutely key to that. So thank you very much. As you've heard, I'm, I'm gonna be retiring. This is my last year in elected public service and I'm sort of, one of the things I'm thinking of doing is I'm gonna try starting a garden and literally you know, tend to my own garden for a while because I've never had a chance really to do that. We'll see if I really like it. I'm hoping I will. <laughs> and I know I've got lots of support here. Thank you so much for what you do. Thank you, Libby, and I was just told that Takas is also here. Can you give away? Oh, you're right in front of me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being here. All right, we've got Doug Kriedemeyer with Department of Environmental Services, and he's going to tell us about the compost system that's being rolled out for multi-family buildings. Thank you. <laughs> you're such nerds. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Um, so as Becky said, I'm going to talk about a pilot program that we're rolling out. Um, but one of the things I'm going to start with is talking about food waste and the problem that it is for one society and the, and the issues that it causes. Um, so I'm going to start off with breaking the ice. And I'm sure a lot of you can relate with the meme that is on the screen. and. You know, it has just kind of been viral, and it's certainly something that I can relate to. Um, and so it just kind of speaks to kind of the underlying issue and the way that we value food sometimes. Um, and so when we talk about the food waste problem, about 40% of all the food generated um, around the world goes to waste um, at some point through the process. Um, a family of four disposes approximately six pounds of edible food waste every year, um, which equates to about $1,500 to $2,200 a year um, that could be saved and spent on other things for them. And so what we need to focus on is changing our relationship with food. Um, it's something that I strive for every day. It doesn't always um, consciously come to mind, but it's something that as you think about, you know, we need to change our behaviors and think about the way that we handle and, and just waste food. Um, and so the best way is not to generate it. So there's tons of tips that you can find online. You know, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has several tips that help you kind of plan ahead and think about 
um, ways to reduce your food waste at home. And then as you know, inevitably food waste will be generated in some way or another. Um, and so the best way to handle it is to compost it. And so as Arlington strives to reach our 90% um, diversion goal away from landfilling or incineration, um, it's one of those things, you know, our food waste in Arlington County's waste stream makes up about 30%. And so there's a huge diversion potential to think about when, you know, we think about food. And so, you know, the EPA just released this in fall of last year. Um, it retools their waste, wasted food hierarchy um, to this new scale. Um, but really the best way is to prevent food waste altogether. Um, and then as I'm gonna kind of talk about, it's, you know, for our system, it's composting that. And so the single family residential have curbside organics and food waste collection um, as one of their services, um, which is really great. Um, and so we are looking at ways to expand that to the multifamily um, community. So right now the current options are dropping off at the Earth Products Recycling Yard in Sherlington. Um, various farmers markets offer um, food waste collection and then some properties, which is very limited, um, do offer contracted services that they provide. Um, so about 71.5% of Arlington residents live in a multifamily dwelling. So almost you know, that's a huge percentage um, of the Arlington population that doesn't have, we'll say, direct convenient access to an alternate disposal method for their food waste. Um, and so the draft solid waste management plan, zero waste plan calls for comprehensive organics management in the years to come. And so as we look towards that, we're looking um, for ways to pilot collection programs alternative to a direct in-house collection system. So, you know, buildings um, are built to the current standards. They have limited space in their loading docks for trash, for recycling, and to add a whole separate collection system um, puts a lot of pressure on them. And so we're trying to find alternative ways that they would be able to offer those services to their residents. And so the pilot will allow us to assess the viability, container performance, and ultimately resident participation, um, and evaluate some of the more effective education efforts in reaching people. So New York City has already rolled out um, a citywide program um, for on-street composting. Um, they have deployed these bins um, in neighborhoods um, every few blocks. And it's one of the services that their Department of Sanitation provides. And so we are using this as a model for our pilot to see how it works within Arlington. So the smart bin design, um, they are really cool actually. Um, really it's a smartphone enabled container to help reduce and eliminate contamination. So with food waste and composting, contamination um, within that stream really um, devalues the quality of the compost that's created. And so having a smartphone access will only allow people who have signed up and um, want to drop off food waste to access the containers. And so it will really only be those people. It doesn't allow someone walking by on the street to drop their bag of trash in it. You have to actually make that action to drop it off. Um, it'll allow us to monitor the um, fullness of the container to allow for the right um, frequency of collection and pickup. And so what we're looking at is um, deploying 10 containers and sets of pairs um, geographically dispersed throughout Arlington. Um, the exact locations are still being um, finalized and thought about, but this is kind of the area in which we're looking. Um, and so the pairs just allows, you know, not just one, if one container fills up, a resident has an alternative to dispose if they're gonna walk down there. Um, and so 
Again, we're going to focus on outreach, education, and resident surveys. We really want to find the best ways of getting to residents, figuring out what their obstacles to participation is, what makes it easy, and really kind of produce a system or look at a system that will benefit the, the residents as a whole. And then ultimately, hopefully develop best practices for the county. And when we get to that point where um, the county board evaluates comprehensive organics management, that we have some of those best practices and guidelines in place that make it easy and efficient for buildings to roll out a system that is effective for them. And so I'm gonna end here with basically, you know, kind of reiterating that aspect of reducing and eliminating food waste. You know, this pilot and on-street food waste collection is a way to manage the food waste, but true success is gonna be measured by the elimination of wasted food. And that all comes back to us and how we operate in our kitchens. Um, and so I will at this point open up for a few questions and then I will be here so we can talk more in depth afterwards as well. Landing, and I'd like to know how we can support this project and uh, we can sign up for it because I run a newsletter for all of Crystal City and I'd really like to promote this high. I live in a multi-family. Um, I was going to say we can get together afterwards and I can give you my contact information. Um, Right now, we're still, like I said, in the final processes of finalizing those particular locations of where the bins will be placed. Um, but what we will be doing is looking to engage with property managers um, to be able to put out the information in the location of bins and talk to residents within their lobbies. So um, if you can give me your contact information, I'll give you mine, and we can kind of set that up once we get further along in the process. Could you put your first slide with your contact information? Yes. I should have ended with a slide. It would have been better that way. <laughs> Thank you. So, You're welcome. I'm, hi. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I know this is an ongoing process and you're starting with the pilot. My building is not in the pilot area. Um, where can we look to continue following this and um, keep track of how it's going? And maybe I know there'll be other public meetings in all likelihood to keep track of it as it moves forward. Um, so we will most likely post updates on the solid waste um, website um, and then probably um, do through communication channels with DES um, promoted and put updates out through those channels. But they can also contact you, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Hi, um, I'm a volunteer for Highlands Urban Garden uh, right by where Carol lives, here's your first question. And we have a lot of compost that we collect. I'm wondering if you guys have any partnerships with any of the community gardens for collecting compost. So right now we do not. Um, our current collection contracts don't allow for um, <laughs> you know, participation outside of the single family residential. So it is something that we reevaluate from time to time. Um, and so hopefully that will be something that comes up in the future. Thank you. Hi there, I have the next question. I'm Nicole, I also live in National Landing. Um, two questions, how quickly do you think these are gonna be deployed in neighborhoods? And also what are some of the barriers to using them that you're looking into? Because I know for me, it's one of these wasn't immediately outside my building, collecting food waste and carrying it across town would probably be my biggest barrier. Um, so yeah. Yes. Um, so really, we're looking to hopefully have this pilot up and running um, by mid-year, so hopefully in the June timeframe. Um, that may get pushed depending on logistics, but that's what we're shooting for. Um, as far as the convenience factor, um, because this is limited, that is one of the things that we have considered is the convenience factor. Um, now, 
we would have ideally liked to have these placed like near building entrances, but it's been very challenging to find property managers that will allow us to place containers on their property. And so we've moved to the, the next best option is looking at deploying them in the right of way near bus stations and shelters, someplace that's convenient for the public um, that doesn't necessarily sit on private property. So Thank you. you're welcome. Hi, the next question. Um, what sort of educational tools are you looking into knowing that this, you have to download an app in order to get access into the device? Um, I feel like people that know and want to use compost would know how to do that, but people potentially that don't know much about compost, they might feel disengaged by the, the barrier of use. So, um, what we're looking at doing is there's kind of multiple educational aspects to it. Um, one is working with property managers to educate their residents on the program. Um, second is to table at the, in the lobbies to be able to speak directly with residents and assist them if they're interested in signing up and walking them through that process. Um, now, technology, like you said, can be our friend and our enemy in some ways, um, but when we evaluated this, the best way to keep that as a, a clean as stream as possible is to keep that kind of lock on it. Um, and so that may be one of the things that comes out of the pilot is finding an alternative um, to the technology access part of it and seeing what other options there might be for, for communities. One more question. Okay. Uh, I'm in a single family home and I have one of those uh, green dumpsters. I want to do my own composting, but why can't you just expand that program and put dumpsters everywhere or, uh, or one of them, uh, a dumpster at each multifamily unit and collect it that way instead of starting a whole new program? So um, we're limited through our current contract terms. Um, and then part of it is is just the overall cost. Um, there is no way for the, the multifamily is regulated through county code. And so there is no direct fee for service that we collect from multifamily um, buildings in order to pay for that service so we would have to go through a process of evaluating and setting something up like that and so this seems um, like a viable alternative um, that would be in line with a few maybe code changes requiring multifamily buildings to have a system in place rather than the county taking on the burden of regulating and doing the collection for that system so thank you And I've been reminded, we do have this all being videotaped. We've got Mr. Nuned here in the center, thank you. And that tape should be available from the FUA website in maybe next week. So you'll have access to these slides and everything you've seen and heard today. All right, I was remiss. We, we do have a little gift for Libby as she is retiring this year and one of our plot gardeners, Puen Lee, put together a, a little starter garden. You can put it right outside, it's ready to go. So it's got a strawberry, it's got, looks like collards and some herbs, maybe arugula, I'm not really sure, but anyway. Frankie, I was actually eyeing this. I And folks, if you want to take a stretch break just to stand up and shake around a little bit, that's fine. But while you're doing that, help me welcome Barbara Hoffheins, John Bell, and Ann Dahl, who are gardeners at the Walter Reed Community Center, and they're going to talk about a very specialized garden that they're working on. Thank you so much.
projector, maybe. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. I'm John Bell. I'm uh, with the Arlington Regional Master Naturalists, as Anne and Barbara, uh, my colleagues behind me. Um, I am here. This is the slides are just in order perfectly. Okay, I'm here to introduce um, our ozone bio indicator garden, um, and my job is actually to let you know our, our tables over here. By the way, if, if you want to get some more information after we're done. Uh, my job is to let you know uh, how NASA is involved uh, with this project. This is right in your backyard. The, the garden is at uh, the Walter Reed Community Center. And um, this image here, is it, can I make it full screen or is it already? It is full screen? It doesn't look like it to me, but that's all right. Everybody can see this. Uh, by show of hands, how many uh, of you are familiar with this photo? Less than I thought. This is considered as one of the most famous photographs of all time. Uh, this is uh, called Earthrise. It was taken by astronaut Bill Anders uh, in the Apollo 8 uh, mission that just orbited uh, the moon, not landed on it, uh, in 1968. And many historians, and I subscribe to this uh, theory as well, actually point to this photo um, as having a huge influence on the environmental movement in this country. Um, of course, six years before that was Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, and many, many people point to that. But I, I make the case that the Apollo missions in general um, actually just had a, a unparalleled uh, influence on our ideas about our planet and our place within it. Um, we went to the moon between 1968 and our last, our last mission there was 1972. In that span of four years, we, had, we celebrated our first Earth Day. Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency was signed uh, into existence by uh, President Nixon. Um, yeah, applause for EPA, maybe not, Ni maybe not Nixon. Um, the, the Clean Air Act was, uh, was, signed, um, was passed by Congress, and the Clean Water Act. This is all in that span of four years. This is all while, while we're traveling to the moon. Bill Anders uh, is quoted as saying, we went to the moon and we discovered Earth. We never really saw Earth from this vantage point in this void, this blackness of space, and we saw just how vulnerable our planet is. We saw how our atmosphere is really just this thin sheen on the planet. If you take our planet and you shrink it down to the size of a classroom globe, our atmosphere actually makes up about the thickness of the lacquer that's on the outside of that globe. It is incredibly thin, incredibly thin. And so this very um, not scientifically accurate photo, uh, this is not to scale, but this shows you the different levels of our atmosphere here. Now, uh, just for scale, the Earth's diameter is around 8,000 miles across. And what this is showing here is just 30 miles. 30 miles up is our, is, um, where we get to the stratosphere, and that is where our ozone layer is. This is our good ozone. Not that ground level ozone is a different kind of ozone, they're both just O3, three oxygen atoms um, in one molecule, but uh, the ozone in the, in the stratosphere actually uh, protects us from the, our harmful UV radiation from, coming from the sun. When it's down uh, in what's called the troposphere where we're breathing this stuff in, it is extremely harmful um, not only to our lungs, it, it, it uh, causes all kinds of inflation, uh, inflammation, excuse me, um, and makes, makes it very, uh, for, especially for people that, that suffer from asthma, um, you don't really want to go outside uh, when there is large amounts of ground level ozone. If you um, ever get those readings of like, oh, the air quality is, is not good, you can check this on airnow.gov. The air quality is not good today, you might not want to go out. Um, on, aver on your average day, it's ozone that, that we're worried about. Uh, that's the, 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 the most uh, primary pollutant that's happening. So um, in Arlington, there's actually only one ground sensor to tell you whether the air quality is good or not. One sensor, actually in Aurora Hills, I think there's a gardener here from Aurora Hills somewhere, but um, several gardeners, okay. Um, that one sensor is great at measuring the ozone content in that one area. Um, but it is not great at, at, at measuring across Arlington. Um, so what can we do about that? Well, NASA put up a satellite called TEMPO. Um, that is the Tropospheric Emissions Monitoring of Pollution. The, NASA loves their, their ac acronyms. Um, and TEMPO is actually going to monitor ozone at the, scale, at the neighborhood scale. Um, I'll show you that scale in a minute. And it's going to actually, across the United States, from, I believe, um, across North America, really, from Mexico City all the way up um, uh, to the Canadian oil sands and from the Atlantic to Pacific. Uh, Tempo is going to be monitoring uh, all kinds of pollution, including ozone, every hour. 
every hour. Um, so this is unprecedented. We've never had a satellite li like this before. We've had others that monitor ozone, but they do it once a day. Um, they're at a different orbit than Tempo. Tempo is at, what, at what's called a geostationary orbit, uh, which means that it takes 24 hours to revolve around the Earth. The Earth also takes 24 hours to rotate on its axis. And so Tempo actually is just uh, appearing in the sky in a fixed position as we, as we rotate. So it is just looking down at North America, able to monitor this hourly, which is, which is great. Um, this is the, uh, the level of, of um, accuracy that we'll have. Uh, these, are other two, these are two other satellites that do not um, orbit at geostationary orbit. Geostationary is about 35,000 kilometers up or 20, 000, about 20,000 miles. Um, these other satellites operate at around 700 miles, something like that. Um, so they're, they're whizzing around the Earth. Um, these acronyms again. Uh, so this is the Global Ozone Monitoring Experiment launched in 2006. And um, that, is the level, that is the level of resolution that that uh, satellite gets. And the other one is the Ozone Monitoring Instrument, um, which was launched in 2004, I believe. And uh, Tempo, so Tempo has about 50 times the resolution of uh, OMI, or the, the ozone monitoring instrument. So incredibly accurate. And what, what we can do with this, not, not least of which, um, is see uh, actual inequities within urban communities. So we can actually look at how, um, on average, uh, low-income minority neighborhoods experience up to 38% more pollution than higher income white neighborhoods. Um, so Tempo is not only giving us uh, science that we can use to um, better uh, understand what we're doing to the environment and how we're actually harming uh, crops. We'll hear in a minute how ozone uh, affects uh, the yields of, of certain crops. Uh, but we'll, we'll also see inequities in our society and, and it's, it's scientific, it's science fact. You cannot refute this, so um, it's a really great project. Um, this uh, is some data that was released uh, in August. I just wanted to mention uh, there, there's still limited data out. This, this uh, satellite was just launched last April, and there's, NASA is slowly teasing out some of the data. They actually just released a whole bunch last week, um, and it's in like beta version or something like that. I don't really understand how they crunch all the numbers uh, and, and whatnot. Um, but this data is just now starting to come out, so it's, it's super exciting. And this is a picture of um, the Tempo is actually that small, uh, shiny um, box on top. The rest is uh, the Intelsat 40E satellite, uh, which provides, I think, like Wi-Fi connection across North America to um, different transportation and, and uh, airplanes and, and stuff like that. Um, I believe this is my last slide. So this is just, what, what can we do about this? What, what can we ourselves do about ozone pollution, ground level ozone pollution? Um, ozone is, self is created by a mix of nitrogen dioxide and what are called volatile organic compounds. Um, volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, are, if you think of the things that you can smell, so like gasoline or uh, paint, um, things like this. Th this is volatile organic compounds in the atmosphere that you're smelling. And nitrogen dioxide, this is your, your exhaust pipe if you, if you, still, if you have a, a, a gas vehicle. And when these two combine and react with sunlight, um, they create ground level ozone. So what we can do is we can limit these VOCs and these nitrogen dioxides um, by getting fuel efficient vehicles, obviously. Um, if, you, uh, if you haven't switched to an, an electric mower, if you, if, you, if you have a yard and you mow your grass, if you haven't switched to an electric mower, I highly recommend it. Uh, my father, who's 75 years old, he loves his. He talks about it all the time. Um, <laughs> Uh, but if you do have a gas mower, one simple thing you can do is, is mow your yard at night when there is not sunlight uh, coming down to react with, uh, with the nitrogen dioxide, uh, seriously, and the VOCs. Now, don't, don't mow it, don't, know, don't mow it, you know, past maybe 10 p.m. or before 6 a.m. or else you might get a call from your neighbors, but um, filling up your gas tank at night as well and not, not on super hot days. So. Um, these are just little things we can do. And compost your yard waste. Don't burn it. That should be a given. Um, and yeah, so, so sorry to, to, to take us out into, into space. I hopefully, Anne Dahl will uh, bring us back down to earth here um, with her presentation.
or do you have yeah, one of these? Have we'll, we'll, leave we'll leave this one. Right there. Okay, thanks, John. I got to follow that and sound intelligent. Um, so, bringing us way back down to earth, we are part of a pro project with the Arlington Regional Master Naturalists to monitor a garden at Walter Reed Community Center. We started it about three years ago. It's a nationwide collaboration, and eventually, correct me if I'm wrong, intelligent John over there, um, the satellite is going to be monitoring these gardens throughout the country, throughout North America to really try to hone in on the ozone. And so what we've been doing is very simple. We put in raised beds right outside the door of the community center and we planted uh, a variety of crops to see what would happen. Uh, we had Christina Conrad from the Cooperative Extension come and she's tested our soil. Um, and the interesting thing about this is the, the um, things that we grow are very controlled. Every garden across the country, across North America, is all provided with the same source of we have potatoes, we have beans, we have tobacco, we have milkweed, and cone flour. Anything else? So they're grown mainly because those are the ones that have been known to uh, show ozone damage as it is more often. Um, so this will be going into our third season, and the interesting thing about this is, um, as Barbara will talk a little bit more about the actual damage, because Murphy's Law, we haven't had that many high ozone days, so we don't have a whole lot of ozone damage over the last three years. But that's part of, of what experimental, experiments do. Um, so it's been really interesting to see. We have some sensitive plants and some tolerant plants. If you're over near the Walter Reed Community Center, feel free to stop by. We've got signs. Um, after this presentation, we've got our little table right over there. And we actually have some potatoes from the garden from the last couple of years that you are welcome to cut and plant. And I'll give you a little introduction on how to do that. We have eaten some of the crops. We're still here. We're not glowing. We're all good. Um, <laughs> And so I think that's all I have to say. Again, stop by and say hello after the presentation. And Barbara is going to go into a little more detail on ozone damage to bring us further down to earth. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. So ozone can damage any plant and plant leaves. Oh, sorry. So yeah, ozone can damage any plants. So, but the plants that we have in our garden, um, the sensitive ones, tended to be ones that were recognized to be more sensitive to ozone to the point where they exhibit uh, this damage. And the way this happens is that the ozone that's created uh, on a sunny day, because you heard from John that you need sunlight to create ozone, um, its molecule is similar in size to CO2, and you know that that plants need CO2 to grow. So the ozone. Oh, I'm still need to sit into it. Ozone has to. Uh, ozone will come into the bottom of the plant leaf where CO2 usually goes, but then it disrupts and disables the photosynthetic process on the top of the leaf. That's uh, when the sun shines on the leaf. So what we see as damage in this picture, here's a picture of the potato. It's uh, the same uh, variety that we're giving away. It's, uh, it's an agricultural variety. It's perfectly edible, and, uh, but, but it, will, it is a little more sensitive to ozone. And the, what you see are these black spots on the leaves. And the black spots congregate inside the veins. And uh, they don't cross the veins. And I'll explain a little bit more about that later. Then on the right is a bean leaf, uh, one of the beans uh, that, oh, I say that it's, oh, the sensitive, we have two kinds. We have a sensitive variety and we have the uh, tolerant variety. This is the uh, sensitive one on the right. You see also it has kind of brown spots and they also are on the uh, inside the veins of the leaves. And over time, if ozone levels are high enough, it will damage the leaves such that um, in, for producing food, uh, it can decrease the, the yield of a plant. So that's why uh, big ag would be concerned about this problem. And also in your own gardens, uh, this could be, uh, it could also reduce your yield. So here's some of the other plants that we have. Uh, we've had tobacco in the garden. This is not from our garden because we've never seen this much ozone damage. But you see the, also, again, the pattern of the, the stipples, the, the spots in between the leaves, uh, in between the veins of the leaves. 
potatoes are a little unusual in that the damage also can show up on the underside of the leaves. And then uh, cut leaf coneflower is one of the leaves that we have in the garden. Uh, we, again, we haven't seen this much damage on either the coneflower or the common milkweed, but um, this is what the ozone damage would look like. Now I have seen uh, along the WNOD uh, uh, path uh, ozone damage on milkweeds, the native milkweeds around here. And uh, I also have seen ozone damage on other plants. For example, over at Longbridge Park, they have some service berry trees. I've seen ozone damage on those leaves. It doesn't kill, it, it's not enough to kill the plant, but it is evident. Um, and then one more. Now, the, one of the issues is there are other diseases, or there are diseases of plants, and, or other uh, uh, things that attack leaves, for example, Flea beetles, they leave the holes in the leaves. That's not ozone damage. And then there's a bacterial leaf disease. We get this a lot at, at Walter Reed where it makes these spots, but those spots cross the veins of the leaves. So we know that that's not ozone damage. So just an example of how there are other things also that attack leaves and, the, and so there are ways to distinguish what the problems might be. And then another, um, Leaf. This is again on a potato. This is a, a early blight lesion. Again, another disease for agricultural crops, but not related to ozone damage. So that's uh, really uh, all I wanted to say, and I think this is the end of our presentation. Yeah. Yeah, we'll do questions. Um, they're going to be around afterwards. So we are right on time, and I'd like to now bring up Donnie Nolan, who is with George Mason University, and she's going to tell us about another specialized garden. Who knew when you came here this morning that you were going to hear about NASA gardening? I didn't. All right, Donnie Nolan. I'm Donnie Nolan. I work at George Mason University for the Sustainability Office, and I'm really excited to tell you about our offerings, uh, so let me get to it. So really quick, my background and who I am, I started at Mason with an undecided major. I did art, music, and theater, and I had no idea what I wanted to study. And I looked at what Mason had to offer, and they had a greenhouse and a garden, and I thought, you know, that looked cool, I've always wanted to have a garden. And I just fell in love, and it was obviously my true calling. And that was over 10 years ago, and I just never left. And they just kept hiring me. I was the president of the garden club, and I uh, helped with the permaculture design certification course that we had back then. And now I've been full time, and so I run the greenhouse and gardens program. And so we teach the community and students how to grow food sustainably. So we have several sites with several methods, and then we donate it. So we have uh, so much food that we grow year round, and we donate it as much as we can. So we do tablings on campus. To those who volunteer, they can take some home. In fact, usually there's too much food, and we end up having to compost it, because like especially like the lettuce just goes bad. Students don't really want lettuce. They're used to eating out. They're busy, they have dorms, they don't even have kitchens, so they don't know what to do with lettuce. Uh, I, sometimes I, I post to the Facebook Buy Nothing group, trying to get people to come to the greenhouse. If I have enough, I'll drive it to the local food bank. So we do have a produce pickups. I have a tabling over here. We have a sign-ups portal. You can sign up to volunteer. Anyone can join us. You can also sign up for our produce pickups if you're interested in stopping by to grab some of our produce. But let me tell you about what we have. So when they first hired me part-time, they wanted to start a hydroponic greenhouse. So this greenhouse was empty and up for grabs, so to speak. The College of Science moved to a brand new rooftop greenhouse, and so they didn't need this one anymore. And they were gonna, they were gonna store lawnmowers in here um, if we hadn't come up and been like, well, you know, we really want to grow food on campus that we can sell to the dining halls. That would be really cool. But there was a lot of food safety issues and red tape and contracts and all that. Uh, but our dining corporation, Sodexo, they were really supportive and they said, well, there's this greenhouse. 
And you could use hydroponics, so there's no soil, and it's very clean. You can sanitize everything beforehand. It's very controlled and locked and safe. Then we'll buy everything you can grow. So we made it happen. They hired me. I had never done hydroponics. I was a pure soil girl, and I just made it work. And so now we harvest food every week and walk it to the dining halls. It is literally just a several feet, feet away from the greenhouse. It is right next door. I'll harvest bins and bins of lettuce and salad greens, and they are served right in the dining hall, right next door. Students can do the growing and then immediately go to lunch and eat this produce. So it is the most precious localist food available on campus. Uh, we also expanded to the greenhouse and we have tomatoes. So with hydroponics, you know, the water's moving through and it's recirculated. So it actually requires on average about 90% less water than having to grow plants outside. Like in the summer, you might have to water every day. They're gonna wilt, right? And that water just goes in the ground, evaporates, and it's gone. Whereas in the greenhouse, it is recaptured and reused and it gets recirculated. And so the fertilizer is also carried in the water and it's completely soilless. There's these little grow stones I use to grow the deep roots for these tomatoes. So I'm able to fit about 20 vines in this four by four foot bed. I mean, you all grown tomatoes before, right? You know how big they can get and how bushy my technique, and I'll, I teach this. We, we train any, all of our volunteers, no prior experience needed. I'm sure you all have a lot of experience, but teaching about the science. As a scientist, I'm also a PhD student, how to actually prune all the, what's called auxiliary meristems. So you're only left with the apical meristem or those stem cells. So every one of these tomato vines is only one vine and it only grows up. And as it grows up, and these grow like inches a day, like, or I mean, a week. There's like seven, about an inch a day. It's about seven inches every week. I have to add a clip, each vine has a string, and then I lower them. And as I lower them, they end up wrapping around the base. And so I'm able to, I was able to fit like 60 tomato vines in this one tiny little room in the greenhouse. It is really, really cool. And then they produce more fruit that way and they ripen quicker because all the energy is going into that one vine. Um, and then sometimes I tell the students they can go around and tickle the flowers, just a little bit of tickle, 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 helps with the pollination. <laughs> um, and I expanded the greenhouse even further as I learned more about the plumbing. It's very technical, but we do a lot of hands-on training, how to fix plumbing, how to design these from scratch. Um, they, these are fancy ones that we buy uh, from Ohio, these channels. And so we're able to grow uh, microgreens and leafy greens. I start all of my lettuce plugs in these trays. And I made these racks, I got this hardware from the hardware store and I bolted them all together and it is five shelves high, eight foot high and you can fit several greens. So I'm able again to fit a lot more in a small space because they're stacked. And with microgreens, they don't even need that much sunlight, right? They grow in about two weeks and you harvest them. They're super flavorful and nutritious. We also have a vertical racking system which does have grow lights growing the channels vertically. There's a lot of shadows there and shade. So a little bit of the LED grow lights are very energy efficient and we're able to grow that way as well. So these systems I actually installed, you can unscrew the plumbing and pull the whole rack out into the walkway and that way you can get back in there and access everything, access the whole shelf with ladders and you can put it back and reconnect the feed and the drain plumbing. So the water goes to the plants, it goes down the incline and then it goes back to your tank and it is able to recirculate and reuse. So on average with hydroponics, plants are growing three to five times faster for that reason. And they get automatically watered. I can go away for the weekend and there's a timer and they already have water. We have automatic nutrients as well. The pH level is automatically controlled. We teach the students all about that chemistry and all that. We also have worm bins. There's some chemistry and math about worm bins too. Anybody can compost indoors. Um, I have a condo and I, I don't have a yard anymore, but I, I stack my patio with, with planters and my worm bins. So anyway, we teach all of that, hands-on, uh, how, to, how to compost uh, indoors and out. So the Greenhouse and Gardens program, we have three major sites. I told you about the Presence Park Hydroponic Greenhouse. We also have Innovation Food Forest, I'll tell you about. That's our permaculture site. And then the Potomac Heights Vegetable Garden, our oldest site. We have several other sites as well. Uh, students who want to do projects for their courses or who need internship credits, we teach them how to design pollinator native landscapes and we help them to get grant money to then buy the plants from local vendors and then put them in the ground 
so they can make a permanent infrastructure change on the campus. So it's a really good learning opportunity. In fact, we just had a master's student install the Foragers Forest in, on our Fairfax campus, which is the first all native edible forest. And she immediately got a job. She hasn't even graduated yet. She immediately got hired by the Fairfax County Stormwater Division uh, because of the work that she did as a student. So these, these kinds of uh, projects I do really help students to translate their experience into a job. But my mission that I made for the program is that we nourish and foster these uh, nourishing spaces, rather, on the campus. Students, they're so busy. They're always on the computer. They feel so disconnected. And they just come to the greenhouse. And, and the gardens and their hands are busy, they're getting dirty, they're able to talk to each other and, and connect and really feel a sense of belonging that really transforms the campus. It's just a concrete jungle full of screens and they're all really stressed and they can just come to the greenhouse and harvest and they help us look for aphids and we do all organic pest management and, and not only is it e ecological restoration that we do and we offer food, but it's these transformational experiences where students are like, I wouldn't eat that. I came out of the ground. It's dirty. And I'm like, well, no, try it. It's kale. It grew all winter. It's actually really frost hardy. It's really good. And they taste it and they're like, whoa, kale is good. It's so good. Or like raw asparagus. Have you ever had raw? Like, I wouldn't buy, eat it raw from the store. But raw asparagus straight from the ground has so much flavor. It's amazing. We're getting to eat the first microgreen. If you've never had microgreens before, the flavor is just amazing. So those kinds of transformational experiences is what we offer. We also have fig trees in the Potomac Heights Garden. That's our site that's almost 15 years old. And our fig trees are huge. We have to prune them back every year. And so we'll get bins and bins of figs in late August and September. And we just put them in boxes and donate them uh, to campus. So students can actually have, I mean, how many of you have had a fresh fig before? Oh, that's good, that's good, that's a lot of people, nice. Like, but some people have never really had like fresh food like this before, knowing that you can eat broccoli leaves or even what broccoli looks like when it grows, you know? All those kinds of learning experiences we offer. We have annual beds. Uh, we also have the compost here. It's a community compost, so we encourage students to take their biodegradable waste and drop it off at our compost sites, and then we use it on the beds, of course. And so everybody who volunteers can get free food. Right now we have cilantro and radish and broccoli and kohlrabi harvesting right now. Um, our other site is the Innovation Food Forest. So it's by Innovation Hall, and it was designed using permaculture. How many here know about permaculture? Nice! So it was coined in the 80s by Bill Mollison, and it's two terms combined, permanent and agriculture. So most agriculture uses annuals, right? You have to replace them, regrow them from seed every year. Whereas with permaculture, you're relying on perennials, right? They are permanent, like trees and shrubs. It's great, you plant them once, you invest that money once, and it should grow bigger and bigger and more and more food for you every year. But the permaculture design concept teaches you how to observe your landscape, ideally through every season, and design it for less maintenance requirements and so that everything works together. Um, so you'll have uh, really tall trees, understory trees, shrubs, herbaceous layers, and root layers all within every bed. It's a lot of companion planting or gilding. We use uh, key lines to make berms and swales so that when water runs down the incline, it catches in your swale and gets stopped by the berm so that you're actually absorbing water into a landscape rather than having it run off and cause erosion, which is a huge issue in landscapes. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that we do teach, and all of it is free as well. We have uh, thornless raspberries and blackberries, which are really cool to have. Um, the elderberries go crazy. So if anyone needs some elderberry, would like some elderberry for their yard, we have a lot of other native plants that are very well established. So if you wanna come visit us and volunteer, or we'll give you a little tour, if you want some of these plants for your yard, we can help you propagate them and take some home. They're free. That is what we are here for. We are a free resource to teach, to offer propagules, to offer food for all these kinds of agriculture. Uh, we have these strawberries here, uh, edible flowers. You know that daylilies are actually edible. And some students didn't even know that flowers can be edible, and they're really tasty. Uh, the garlic chives are 
harvestable any time of the year. The lemon balm has kind of taken over, so feel free to take as much as you want. And our passion fruit vine, one of my favorites. In May, they start blooming. We'll get the fruits in September. They are actually native uh, to, the, to the east of Americas, and they are so good. It's like handy when you eat the fruit. It's just amazing. There's also some edible tubers and bulbs as well. We have persimmon trees and a few pawpaw trees. Does anyone know about pawpaws? Yes, I'm in the right crowd. <laughs> We're obsessed with pawpaws. Uh, we have a few trees that are, that are about to bloom. They're pretty large. Um, and so we always like to have that experience to offer students eating their first pawpaw for the first time. Uh, so we also do landscaping projects, as I mentioned, teaching folks how to plant and do perennial landscaping. Um, this is our comfrey. Has anyone heard of comfrey before? Yeah, it, uh, it accumulates nutrients. I like to call it the mascot of permaculture. Um, it's also known as knit bone. So it actually helps to heal broken bones and wounds. In fact, if you put it on a fresh cut, it can heal the skin so fast that it can cause an infection because the bacteria gets stuck in there. So it's extremely powerful at promoting uh, regeneration in our, in our cells. So these highly medicinal plants as well, we grow and teach about. And the comfrey, you can't get rid of it. Once it is there, it keeps the weeds out. It's gonna accumulate nutrients in the soil. It's gonna break up that heavy clay and they're really great to have in the garden. So if you want some comfrey, you can come by and get some. We have plenty of it, just dig some up. They're very easy to plant, very hardy. And then these gorgeous purple flowers that the bees absolutely adore. We also do grow your own microgreen grow kits. So especially when COVID started and all my students went home, I was shipping them in the mail these kits and collecting their uh, opinions and experiences as data to figure out how can we get people to grow more food at home. What's funny, the hardest part is actually harvesting them, but how many of you uh, have heard or had microgreens before? Yes, I love microgreens. As I've already mentioned, they only grow for about a week to maybe four weeks for basil or slower growing varieties. Uh, they're very nutritious. Studies have shown repeatedly that they have 40 times the concentration of nutrients than a mature plant. So taking all that sunlight water to grow a mature plant, all that fertilizer in space, you can get a lot more of those nutrients in this tiny little quick, tiny plant. Uh, so I have a few, I'd only brought a few grow kits, so I'm already out today. But uh, if you come to the greenhouse, we offer them for free. Uh, we reuse our plug trays that would otherwise be trash, where we get our plugs for the hydroponics. We start our lettuce seeds. Instead of throwing them out, we cut them up, add, put soil in them, and offer them as a little plug tray so that students can sprinkle seeds and uh, grow them. And if you have the courage to actually kill your baby plants and eat them and add them to whatever you're eating, I'll add microgreens to anything. Sandwiches, pastas, anything savory. Uh, the lemon basil microgreens taste like fruity cereal. And I would put them on like ice cream. They're absolutely amazing. So really anything you eat should have microgreens on it. Um, but we don't have too many kits, but we do have a pamphlet with some information. I built a, uh, a whole 10 page document. You can scan the QR code to read my instructions on how to grow microgreens, how to address any mold issues, how to harvest them, anything you might have to, to know. As a PhD student, I'm also studying the roots. Very common in hydroponics is root rot, which is caused by a microscopic pathogen. So here I am looking at the roots. These ones are healthy, but sometimes roots can also rot, especially this amaranth microgreen, which is this beautiful bright red color, but they're really hard to grow because they're very susceptible to root rot disease. So I'm studying how beneficial microbes can actually promote root root growth as well as protect them against the pathogen. How many of you use beneficial microbes in your garden already? Oh, okay, well if you have any issues, or who's heard of mycorrhizal fungi? Yeah, so fungi actually are symbiotic with plants. They can protect, grow around the root and inside the root and give the plants nutrients, give them water when they need it, give them protection from disease. So if you're getting like root rot diseases, you might want to you know, increase the drainage or water less if you can, but you can buy products that have all kinds of bacteria and fungi that are gonna help your plant. And so my research will study how that can work in hydroponics. If we do hydroponics in space, I guarantee this pathogen will also end up in space. It is all over the world, it affects all plants. It's gonna be a bigger issue with climate change. So hoping that I can involve my interns and my, my research to help address that fact. 
We also do cooking events uh, to teach folks how to grow food. Students don't know what to do with the produce, so we show them. So in our gardens or uh, whenever we find a space every semester, we'll plan an event, teach students about events planning. But anybody can join us. We did a global rice and beans fest most recently, and we had a Vietnamese student who showed us how to make summer rolls. You can take really any veggies and put them in the summer roll with a rice wrapper. We did popcorn. We grew popcorn on corn stalks, and you can pop it in the microwave. Um, so those kinds of things. So anybody is welcome to volunteer. So here's my contact info. You can find our Instagram, Sustain Mason, as well. If you would like to sign up to volunteer, green.gme.edu. Pretty easy to remember. We're green at GMU. And you can create an account on our volunteer portal and then look at our calendar of shifts and sign up to volunteer, sign up for our events. There's all kinds of things uh, on that portal. Some of my colleagues do litter cleanups on campus. There might be a farmer's market event. Um, you, can, you can see on that calendar. So hopefully you'll be able to get to Fairfax and check us out. We have a lot to offer. And I'm here for questions. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Johnny. We have time for two or three questions. Do you have any questions right now for Donnie? Questions? Yeah. All right. Well, we'll just oh, move. I have one question. Oh, OK. Do you have, uh, does George Mason have classes for seniors about microbiome and microbeans and all that? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, that's a great question. So actually, we do have an affiliate campus called Ollie. It's the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. It's right on Roberts Road, um, just outside of the campus. And it is for retirees. You pay a one-year fee, and you can sign up for any of the course offerings. And I just started last year. I do a summer program where every week we go into the greenhouse and gardens, and I teach about all these science and all the tips that I have on how to grow food sustainably at our sites. Um, you can get the same kind of education just volunteering as well, uh, where we offer the hands-on experience. But if you're interested in Ollie, um, you, can, you can look it up, and it's a really great program. I don't know if they have anything specifically about microbiomes, but I, I, I did a lecture last fall on Zoom for them. So if there's a request, if, I should, if they want to do, I could do a lecture on a specific topic, such as microbiomes, which is what I'm studying for my PhD. So I would love to do that, and there might be some similar opportunities you'd be interested in. Thank you for asking. Yes. Meeting would be on the green.gmu.edu. So I did a Zoom once for the Ollie program. For the Ollie. Yeah, I did, a, I did a lecture on GMOs to actually explain the science behind them. Uh, so that could be a, our next topic could be microbiomes. Question in the back there, yes? Um, sort of a piggyback off of that. Uh, do you partner at all with the office or preschool continuing education of George Mason? We do a lot of... Um, there's a lot of continuing education. I'm a preschool teacher. We manage a, a garden, and it's a teaching garden as well as a producing garden. So we, we participate with Plot Against Hunger. We have four-year-olds. Are there any courses that we could do that would meet some of our continuing education credits that might help inform our curriculum for the garden? Ooh, that's a really good question. Currently, we don't offer any like official like CEUs, continuing education units, unfortunately, because that's like a whole process that I haven't been able to figure out yet. Um, we have taken groups of kids to campus, um, and through the Ollie program um, and through my program, you can receive like the informal kinds of education. Uh, but I would have to look into how to actually get the the units that would then be on your uh, on your record. You know, that would be I don't we don't have that currently. Okay, last question. Okay, I have a small house. How can I grow hy hydroponic plants? Do I have to build a huge structure in the backyard and annoy my neighbors? <laughs> no, hydroponics can be even like a mini little desktop system. It can be very, very tiny. Like the microgreens, you can do hydroponically just on like a plate even with some like paper towels and just keep them wet and sprinkle the seeds on there and they can grow really quickly. Yeah, it can be very, very small. It doesn't have to be a big system and usually they are indoors and they can be tiny. You can find them online. Yeah, very good question. If anybody else has any other questions, I will be tabling here all afternoon, so uh, feel free to come talk to me. Thank you so much. I think she could teach us all about vocal projection, too. Wow, that was awesome. All right, we're going to turn to our Plot Against Hunger portion of the program. And first off, help me welcome Jennifer Hankins and Sandy Newton. They're going to talk about this year's featured garden, Arlington House Garden, which is located at the Arlington House site in our nation's national cemetery. Welcome, Jennifer and Sandy. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Jen Hankins, and this is Sandy Newton, and we are really excited to be here to tell you about the Arlington House Garden, Kitchen Garden. Um, I think a lot of people are familiar with Plot Against Hunger, or at least have heard about it, but I think that uh, not very many people know that we do have this great plot right in the heart of Arlington National Cemetery, and um, we, uh, you know, we have, it's a very special, magical place uh, to work. Um, because we are right next uh, to the enslaved quarters. We overlook uh, the cemetery, the river, DC, the monument. So it's really a spectacular place to be. Um, and so it's the original kitchen garden for the, Lee, the Custis Lee House that was built in 1802 to 1818. And it's a quarter of an acre that is split into two beds by a pathway that goes to a gift shop and uh, it's lined by apple trees. So we also have a, a small orchard that we work. And one of the special things about our garden is that three million people come to the cemetery every year, and many of them come to Arlington House and then sort of stumble across the kitchen garden and see what we're doing, um, what Plot Against Hunger is doing, and how we're donating all of our produce uh, to um, area food banks. And they really do love it, and I think they take that back you know, to their home states, um, that information. And so um, one of the, uh, we are very lucky in that we have a lot of support from FUA and PLOT, of course, mm -hmm. but then we also um, have the support of the National Park Service because um, Arlington House is part of, they manage that property, so they manage um, the garden as well. Um, and so we have their support in organizing really rather large uh, volunteer groups uh, come in, like corporate uh, groups come in. We've had a lot of support from Amazon, MasterCard, um, Nestle's. Uh, Nestle's getting ready to come, and uh, the Student Conservation Corps. So we can handle up to 40 volunteers in one day, and we have plenty of work for them all to do. Um, so that's really great. And then we also have the support of the Arlington House Foundation, which um, we're really excited about that. They've recently adopted us. They've been helping to fund some of our bigger projects. And um, Sandy, who's been with the garden for uh, 12 years, has sort of gotten a promotion up to the foundation board, um, which I think <laughs> <laughs> it, it is a promotion anyways. But, um, but it's really great for our garden because now we're going to have a voice on their board and nobody knows uh, the garden historically um, and what it needs more, you know, better than Sandy does. So we're very excited about how um, that relationship will only be improved. Um, and they've uh, already started funding us in really important ways. They've, the last two years, they've supplied us with compost at the beginning of the season. Last fall, we got mulch. They paid for mulch for us. Um, they've expanded our blackberry, raspberry, and grapevines. Um, and then they've also, are, we're going to get two rows of strawberry plants this season. So they've really done a great job um, stepping up and helping us. And they're very excited about the garden and the story it tells about the property. Um, that being said, we do have some very unique challenges at our garden, which I find inspiring. Um, <laughs> because we're part of a historic property, we, um, we can't use 21st century methods of gardening. So we really rely heavily on period gardening, um, which is you know, a lot of fun. No costumes, <laughs> but just old fashioned work. Um, and so some of, I, I'd like to talk about a few of our challenges, probably not unique to gardening, but sort of unique in how we have to creatively um, address them. The first one is the soil. Like uh, Arlington House went through a really large renovation a few years ago. And while that was going on, they used the garden as a staging area for all their large equipment and supplies, and it really damaged the soil of the garden. We got it back, started working it again, and um, it was very com you know, compact, um, which caused some runoff problems, erosion problems. It wasn't absorbing the water, um, and then just it, it needs a lot of amendments. And so we're sort of uh, working through that right now. Um, we've um, well, David Sachs, you know, he's out there. He came by the garden and really helped us work through, yes, thank you, David, um, a, 
a process of how we can, within the limits of what we can do at the garden, um, sort of start healing the, the soil. And so we have, as I said, gotten some compost. We've adding, added compost. We've added mulch. We've, um, he helped us through the process of uh, utilizing cover crops to help revitalize the soil. And he loaned us his broad fork for probably a whole season. Um, and we've had volunteers using the broad fork, breaking up the soil, because we can't use a, a, you know, a traditional tiller. Um, and so we've already seen a lot of progress in the soil and, and particularly the way the uh, it absorbs water better, we have less erosion. Um, so that's been great. Um, another problem we have is pests. I know every garden has pests, but we cannot uh, modify the footprint, so we can't add any uh, fencing or anything like that to help keep uh, the animals out. And so what we uh, are focusing on are sort of natural remedies. We've, we're doing marigold borders um, to try and keep some of the pests out. We are uh, really trying to focus on um, the, the types of plants that, that deer don't like as much. And so we've had a lot of success with certain crops like eggplant, corn, sweet, uh, not sweet potatoes, but regular potatoes, um, and hot peppers. The deer don't seem to bother them, and so we were expanding. <laughs> yeah, um, and so we've, you know, are expanding the amount of area that we put in those types of crops, um, and then the ones that they really do like, the okra, the the new tomato plants, uh, sweet potatoes. We are. Um, trying to protect that. Um, Sandy did a great job researching, um, you know, sort of historical methods, and we found out that we do have. Um, we, we do have access to chicken wire, and so we've started using chicken wire with bamboo to build some sort of fencing and things like that um, to keep them out. And then we're also going to try trellising this year. We're going to build some significant trellising to keep the, the squash and things up off the ground so that the animals can't get to it as easily. Um, and then uh, our final issue is uh, man hours. We, um, have a large garden and it creates a lot of work. We right now have seven um, very dedicated volunteers. We have two work days a week, Wednesdays and Saturdays. Um, and but and we have that support of the corporate um, volunteers, but it's it's really not enough. And so what do we do about that? We um, we have a ton of weeds that requires a lot of work. Um, so what we've done is we started mulching the rows with cardboard mulch to sort of suppress the weeds. We had a lot of success with that, um, where we could put that um, to use in the garden last season. We're going to do more of that. Um, we also started rotating cover crops to about 25% of the garden, um, which is very low maintenance. It helps the soil. It looks beautiful. It brings the um, pollinators in. So it's been very successful. Um, and then we've put about 10 to 15 percent of the garden in perennial plants, which is sort of historically used medicinal plants and herbs and um, asparagus, our uh, grapevines, um, berries, horseradish. and horseradish, and you know some of the things that come back. So that's you know reduces the amount of work we have to start each season doing. Um, but that sort of brings me to our ask, and I think this ask applies to all of the plots, is that um, we would love to recruit five to ten more regular volunteers. Um, and if we could do that, we really, we are very confident that we could probably double our production this season, because we've got all these other things in place. Now we're ready for more manpower. Um, and so we harvested and donated 600 pounds last year. I think we could easily do 1,000 or more um, this coming season, and even doubling that the year after as we start um, continue, continuing the process to improve the soil. So um, that being said, we have two dates already on our, our books. We have March 17th, which, which Historically, um, the Custis family always uh, planted their potatoes that day, and so we continue to do that, and they do really well. So that's Sunday. We'll, you know, if anybody's interested uh, in joining us, we'll be there Sunday morning. And then March 22nd, we have our foundation, the compost the foundation is providing um, arrives, and we will be moving that up to the garden. So we would love extra help um, in that area. Um, and so, uh, 
think, yeah, we have a QR code here. If you have any questions, this is our Instagram account. Um, follow us, and you can message me with any, if you're interested in finding out more information. Um, and as for volunteers, yes, we'd love regular volunteers, but we like one-time volunteers. We like group volunteers. No experience necessary. Um, and if you just want to come by and you know visit the garden and see what we're up to, I'm pretty sure you'd fall in love with it and want to stay and continue. But so, anyways, that's um, if you have any questions. Can you say what your email is? So we can contact you. Sure, it's um, Jen J E N dot Hankins H A N K I N S at S B C Global dot net. Yeah. I have a comment. I have volunteered with this group oh, for a couple Pam. years. Oh, that's Pam. Her name is Pam. Um, just getting on the property at Arlington to drive your car to park it is a spiritual experience. <laughs> Early in the morning, it's quiet. You see all of these headstones and all of these people who have contributed to where we are today. In addition to that, the people that work there and you are tilling the soil that enslaved people tilled years ago and all of that comes to you when you are in that garden and the last point the third point is the view from the arlington house is the best view in all of the dmv yeah so come for that if you come for no other reason thank you so much i mean because it's really hard to convey how special it is thank you so they will be around in the back with their, with their garden table. And just a, a quick note, you can't just show up at Arlington House. So make sure that you contact Jen in advance, at least three days in advance, because this is a National Park Service site, and you will need to, get, to give them your car information so that you have access to drive in, because they don't allow that for just anybody. All right. Our next Plot Against Hunger speaker to tell us about gleaning opportunities is Pete Riley. Help me welcome Pete. Good morning, everybody. Uh, you're going to like my presentation because it's short. And the first thing you're going to like is I want everybody to stand up, stretch out, move your limbs, get the blood flowing. No one's going to fall asleep on my watch. <laughs> All right, everybody, get a little movement. Whew. All right, my, my task is to recruit you. That's right, you, you. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to be as effective as Donnie. Donnie, you want to help me even recruit? <laughs> Um, but I've also uh, I've got a, a, a big task because I have to squeeze in a lot of information. They said, do it in three minutes. Oh, boy. So anyway, I will try to do that. I'm going to use a little farm boy math, and that is I'm going to give you 10,000 words, and I'm going to squeeze it in. I'm going to do it through 10 pictures. So I'm uh, going to tell you a little bit about the gleaning, which is free. You don't have to pay to join us. Um, you do something fun, and you really make a contribution. So I'm going to spell out what we do. We start with gleaning. Gee, it's green. It's glamorous. <laughs> Oop. Some, some techie screwed this up. Uh, no, it's lovely landscapes, and you get laughter. E, it's elevating. Lift your horizons. And exciting. You get to clean cucumbers and brush dirt off potatoes. Great excitement. <laughs> hey, a lot of food, a lot of fun. <laughs> and nourishing and neighborly. So now, now I'll give you a, a couple factoids. Uh, last year, we collected over 45,000 pounds of produce. <laughs> We delivered to uh, 20 pantries and food distribution points. Um, you know, just one thing I should step back, and some people say, what is gleaning? You know, it goes back into the Bible where a farmer would leave an unharvested plot 
for the poor people. In our case, what we just say is it's, it's harvesting unused food that gets uh, distributed to people in need. So it's a fun activity. Uh, if you take that 45,000 pounds and you apply it to some market value, like what you'd pay in a store, it'd be worth almost $90,000. So let me uh, finish up with a little more detail. Um, in addition to picking food in the, in the field, we have a lot of other opportunities. So if you don't really want to get your feet dirty, um, there are many related activities, such as identifying pantry needs and schedules. When can they take it? What will they take? Uh, procuring supplies, boxes, bags, etc. Locating new farm and orchard opportunities. We, we go in the metropolitan area. Uh, typically, we start um, when the harvest season starts, usually late June, and then we're pretty busy through July into the fall. We might have some opportunities this spring for some collard greens that have overwintered. Uh, there's also opportunities to bag, putting the produce into distribution channels and, and delivering. So the volunteer opportunities, if you don't want to get your Gucci's dirty, once again, uh, there's, there's one of our uh, deliverers. He has a really uh, uh, interesting vehicle to deliver, but we, we use all sorts of vehicles. And uh, finally, clear on this note, just a few more extra pictures to give you a sense of what it's like. So please join us. You can sign up. Now, I've given a quota. So if I don't get the quota, I'm going to lock the doors until everybody <laughs> signs up. All right, folks, thanks very much. Hope to see you. Yeah, I just want to take umbrage with, uh, you know, I do like <laughs> your own accounts. But I would say that when you arrive at this place, it is I would say as spectacular as Union City because often we go around the Beltway and we arrive at the USDA property and you drive through the gates and you're in a farm, just in yeah. the Beltway, and all of a sudden you're just surrounded by all this land and crops and uh, really great people. So, uh, enough shout out for, uh, for the cleaner. <laughs> Thanks, Hank. Go ahead. Harvesting collards uh, the week after next. So harvesting, yeah, collard green harvesting uh, the week after next. So there's sign up outside. Yep, there's sign ups outside. Thank you. All right, now we've got Lila Leichold who's going to tell us about the, the, the produce bagging program at Rock Spring Congregational United Church of Christ, which is my church. So I'm here to talk to you about what she just said. Um, and what is the... Can you hear me now? So this is the Rock Spring Church distribution site at Carpenter Hall. And for those of you who don't know exactly what we do here, um, we will take your produce, gardeners, and we will pack it up, weigh it, pack it up, we keep track of it for you, and then we deliver it to pantries. So this is a produce, it could be excess produce, say you've got your, your freezers full, your neighbors turn off their lights when they see you coming with another bag of produce, <laughs> bring it to us, we will package it, and we will send it to um, pantries for you. Just to put in a bit of context, here is the 2023 data. Um, 53 more or less community church individual and school gardeners delivered 8,979 pounds to us and then on their own they delivered an additional 5,376 pounds for a total of 14,355 pounds. Thank you. So this is not a you know fly-by-night operation. So here's a few tips for delivering your produce to Rock Spring. This is a lot of produce. Um, not this. This is a lot of produce and we're wondering how can we do it most efficiently. So I've surveyed some of the volunteers and here's some tips that they came up with. Number one, thank you for washing your soiled produce. If you can't wash it, please just brush off the dirt and pack it up separately. Um, we accept bulk or pre-packaged um, produce. Uh, you, if you do package it up, please think about a family of four. You can package it in a clamshell, um, compostable bag, Ziploc bag, whatever comes to hand. But we do accept bulk. That's fine, too. 
Um, please no not on buggy or split produce. One of our volunteers suggested not to send in, um, what are they called? Puen, 100 something tomatoes, some kind of sweet, sweet, sweet million and sweet 100 tomatoes because apparently they split easily. We get a lot of green tomatoes at the end of the year. We're kind of, we're kind of um, divided on those. They get a little bit mushy. We'll leave that to your discretion. Um, please label peppers, not the regular green peppers. <laughs> but we get a lot of um, beautiful peppers and we're not sure about their Scoville level, if they're hot, sweet, or medium. So please label what their Scoville level is so that we can let our clients know. And then if you get, sometimes we get these beautiful um, produce and we're not really sure what they are. So <laughs> label anything that's unusual. A lot of our volunteers are not gardeners, so I'd like to know what they are. Thanks. What is it? I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I googled unusual produce and these are what came up. I think it's ramps. Sunchokes maybe? I don't know what the one in the middle is. Anybody know? That is jackfruit. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and then please make sure that we have an email or a contact address for you so we can let you know about events like this, seedling giveaways, seed giveaways. We try to be not only a distribution center but sort of a clearinghouse for gardeners so that we can sort of help organize you and us. And So make sure that we have um, some kind of contact for you. And that's it. Oh, no, if you want to volunteer. We love volunteers. We need baggers. We need drivers. And finally, um, you can visit our, I'll be out there at the table. We've got a tip sheet with most of this on it. We've got lists of uh, pantries. We've got some other things to give away. So please visit me out there. Are there any questions? No? Okay, good. Thank you. And now we have Cassie Ravo, who is here from Randolph Elementary, and she's going to tell us about how that produce is received at the a produce uh, food pantry. So, Cassie. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Cassie Ravo. I'm the coordinator of the Randolph Food Pantry that's run out of Randolph Elementary School in South Arlington. As the resident, maybe only non-gardener here, uh, I'm here to tell you about how all of your efforts actually hit the ground and help serve the families that come to our food pantry. We are an entirely, there we go. Um, we are an entirely volunteer run program and so we rely on a lot of different partners in order to help make our pantry happen. So we, are, uh, we have been a beneficiary of the Friends of Urban Agriculture Plot Against Hunger program which provides fresh produce to our pantry. Um, we distribute to an average of 120 families every month. Uh, we just had a distribution yesterday. Uh, we had over 130 families, which is a little bit higher than we usually see. So the need is really continuing in Arlington. Um, and these sorts of programs really help us to provide to the, to the community that we serve. So a little bit about Randolph. Uh, it is a Title I school. Roughly 75% of our students qualify for free or reduced meals. And with the high cost of living in Arlington, many of our families experience food insecurity and challenging living situations. It's a culturally and, linguis and linguistically diverse community. Families speak more than a dozen languages other than English, with Spanish, Amharic, Arabic, and Bengali as the most common, and originate from nearly 20 nations. Our food pantry helps sustain families nutritionally, and it's also served to build community ties during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so we've been able to help bring in different resources to our families. We have the county come. Um, they were there two months ago to talk about uh, camp, free and reduced camp programs for our families. We're able to partner with uh, groups like Plot Against Hunger in order to get more services into our families. We're also a, a COVID vaccine site um, during the vaccine rollout. So just anything we can do to get the services to our families who may not have the access to get places otherwise. Uh, prior to uh, March 2020, the COVID pandemic, we distributed on an as-needed basis. We then moved to a more robust model. We serve the families weekly uh, from March of 2020 through the fall of 2021 when we then moved to a monthly distribution. Uh, we are a capital area food bank distribution site where we receive a lot of shelf stable products for our families, oil, masa, beans, tuna, et cetera. 
Um, we typically get a couple of fresh produce items, one or two per month, uh, but time and again, we hear over and over again, can we get more fresh produce? Can we get more fresh produce? That's something we are always trying to do. Uh, because we are volunteer run, we don't have a whole lot of money that we have access to, uh, which makes partnerships like this important to get the food on the ground. So the, the, the food that we get supplements these items. Um, we are committed to trying to provide as much healthy, nutritious food to our family. And the Plot Against Hunger program has made this possible through donations, including winter squash, summer squash, collard and sweet corn, if I can plug again. Labeling things is super helpful. <laughs> we'll also often get items in our families, especially, as I said, a lot of our families may not have originated in the United States. Um, if they're not familiar with the items, they will ask our volunteers what they are and how to prepare them. We don't always know. So as much information as you can provide is really helpful that we can then uh, pass it along to our families. Um, the food also that we receive from Plot Against Hunger also allows us to use any additional of our limited resources to supplement other areas. So if we do have funding, we often try to get produce first because that's one of the highest needs. But if we are able to get these, these resources, um, we then try to buy things that maybe aren't covered by SNAP benefits. So things like toothpaste, toothbrushes, laundry detergent, to help free up room in, their, in the family budget, in their food budget, so they can buy additional items to help serve their family. So I will conclude by saying thank you in advance to all of you who are gonna volunteer for this program. It is genuinely a huge help to um, the families that we are fortunate to serve every single month. Um, we are so grateful when we get these huge, uh, these huge containers, we send volunteers over, they load up their cars and bring it in. Our families love to see it and we are very grateful for all of your time and effort, so thank you. Thank you for that, Cassie. It's always nice to put a face with a food pantry, so we really appreciate you being here today. All right, now we have Jennifer Hankins again to talk about some volunteer opportunities for high schoolers, and we have FUA Board President Emily Landsman to also talk about volunteer efforts through Friends of Urban Agriculture. And I just want to, sh they, they are making uh, seed bombs outside at one of the tables, so you can do this afterwards. If we get rainy weather, uh, your seed bomb may sprout before you get it planted, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, really Okay, so um, we, this is our first year on um, plot of having um, a senior experience program. Actually, I see two, maybe two of our guys back there who will be uh, helping us out during their senior experience. Um, and we're really excited about that because I think it's, a, it's a, a great age to sort of get introduce people to gardening and we obviously need the help. And then uh, our hope is to expand that program to a summer internships for um, you know, high school students of all ages. Um, and so hopefully this summer we'll have uh, information about that. Yep. Go ahead. And our other new program will be Saturdays in the Garden. So starting in April, it'll be April and May, we'll have each Saturday morning um, a different garden kind of rotating. Um, it'll be the Highlands Urban Garden, uh, we'll have Arlington House, um, St. Andrews, um, uh, TJ Middle School. So uh, every Saturday morning for, uh, right now it's eight weeks. We, we might continue it later. Um, in the growing season. That information is on the website right now, but we're going to be putting the sign-ups later this week. So if you want to kind of uh, taste the different gardens, uh, now is, is a good time to get started. Uh, so that's, the, that's very quickly our, our, new, uh, our new volunteer opportunities uh, that we've started. So uh, the next part, I'm just going to head right in. So the next um, big thing that we, um, we do, you know, one of our big giveaways here at the Spring Garden Kickoff is our, our seed packets. Um, we spend a lot of time getting donations from seed, uh, seed companies, and a lot of that comes from uh, the efforts of one of our uh, Plot Against Hunger committee members, Mila. And she's contacted seed companies around the country. And we got donations from now 20 different companies, including a lot of local Arlington seed companies. Yes. 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 Um, we have some local uh, Arlington businesses and um, local DMV businesses um, who have donated uh, a total of uh, 3,500 packets of seeds, they're uh, 2023 20, and 2024 20, seeds, so they're, they're new, they're not like old stuff, even though a lot of old seeds can still germinate. Um, 
We have hundreds of veggies, flowers, and herbs. The idea is that you take these seeds, you grow them at home, or you grow them on your balcony, you grow them on your rooftop, or you know, depending on what they are, maybe on your windowsill. Um, and some of it, hopefully, will come back to plot. Um, hopefully, you know, you'll just like we talked about, you'll have an excess of, of something, and you'll give at least some of it back to the to the program. Um, we have a number of seeds. I don't know how many we we, we brought today, but. Um, we're asking you to just choose five of your favorites uh, so that we can continue to give out uh, later in the year for, for future giveaways. If you are part of a school garden or a community garden and you have, um, or that, that donated last year, um, please come see Mila um, for, for, for a different program. Uh, I know some have already contacted her, so please, please um, come see that them. We actually, um, so if any of you have heard of Epic Gardening, uh, Botanical Interest, um, they're a fabulous company and they have done a lot to uh, assist us this year and we actually, they actually sent us a neat little video and a thank you. So we're going to go ahead, hold on a second, hold on right here. Yeah, hold on. And you can tell everybody, search Epic Gardening, Epic Gardening. on YouTube or TikTok or um, Instagram. They are a fantastic group of people. Okay. And very funny and very educational. Yes. And I, how did I do it before? Oh, I'm going to try it. Do you have one? It's on your computer. It's, it's right here. Oh. No, I, I got it here. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. We had it before. Hold on, hold on, hold on. No, no, no. We, we, we had it right before. Hold on, hold on, hold on. It was playing before. We had the sound before. Yeah, okay, so while I figure this out, we actually, we're, we're going to skip ahead and we're going to do the door prizes right now. So come on, come on into the center here. So and take the take the take this mic. Okay, so everybody get your ticket. And I have a ticket to win. And we do have the four twenty-five dollar gift certificates from Botanical Interest. We have a pack of twenty seeds. We have two signed gardening books. We have a winter sewing kit that already has spinach growing in it, and we have two of the Plant of a Native's plant guides. So first person gets to gets their choice, second person gets their choice, etc. First number, I'm just gonna read the last four digits. Two, five, eight, zero. Okay, Becky. 
What, why don't we, I'll, I'll do this and then we'll do the last, okay, last we'll one. Yeah. So, okay, or, or do you want, you want to call that one? Let's call that one. We have 2640 and 2531. 2640 oh, 2531. Oh, you have winners? 2531, excellent. There's the gift certificates, there's a signed book, there's winter sewing, and these two plant over native guides. All right. Two six four zero. Nobody. All right. All right. So uh, we'll do the second half right at right at the end, and uh, I think I, I think I can do the sound now. Hey everybody, this is Chris Moriarty, Director of Customer Experience at Epic Gardening. I was just telling Jacques and Kevin today about your spring kickoff, Plot Against Hunger. We love that name. Um, anyway, we're super excited for you guys. There's nothing that we love more than gardeners helping gardeners. We know how great gardening is for the soil, for the planet, for humanity, for exercise, for mental health, for physical health. There's no greater gift that you can give to your community than helping them become more sustainable. Best of luck. We can't wait to see how it goes. So yeah, so we just we, we want to thank all the seed companies that have that have donated, and just that alone, they're they're very interested in what we're doing. So we we appreciate uh, the support from Epic Gardening and to our board members who have uh, donated items to the uh, the giveaway. Becky, Puen, Mila, um, and now uh, so we're going to talk about some of the the tables that we have. Um, Kirsten, do you want to you want to come up? Yeah, well, no, no, actually come up so you can have the mic. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, 60 seconds. 60 seconds. And Kirsten's going to tell you about some of the uh, extension tables that we have. Today. Hi, everybody. I'm pleased to be served Arlington County as the extension agent from Virginia Cooperative Extension. And I just want to tell you very briefly about some of the services that Cooperative Extension provides to gardeners and, um, and to Friends of Urban Agriculture and Plot Against Hunger folks. Uh, first of all, we have lots of information about native plants. We have soil testing kits. If you need to know about what's in your soil, how to fertilize your soil, we can help you with that. We have plant clinics at the local farmers markets. We have a help desk at the Farrington Community Center, which is open daily in person from 9 to 12. You can email, you can call us. Um, Joan, hold up one of those cards over there, please, the help desk cards. Um, pick up one of those. It has all of our information about plant clinics, help desk, and for our demonstration gardens too. Our demonstration gardens are open to the public and anybody can visit. Our big vegetable garden is up at the Potomac Overlook Park and um, it's open year round and it has just undergone a beautiful brand new renovation of the beds. So do visit our tables. We've got native plants. We've got container gardening exhibit over here. We've got a table on nutrition that's put together by our financial and consumer sciences person over here. We have a table out in the hallway on um, winter sewing. So um, thank you, I'm here for the duration and I really appreciate working with this group and these very smart gardeners here. All right, thank you, Kirsten. We have one, two, three, four, five, six more. And two gift certificates are still up here. So two, five, four, four. Stan? Really? Awesome. And 2572. 2544 and 2572. Anybody? Yes. All right. We'll let Stan pick first. He was drawn first, so. <laughs> sure. Five. Five nine five. 
Wow. All right. Oh, you bet. Yeah. Yeah, two five nine five. Yes. I was leaving the two off because they're all going to be a two. Our ear, our ears got used to hearing it though. So. All right. Yeah. 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 All right, how many more do we have? Three. Three more. 2590. Zero.
soil and water associate director with the Loudoun Soil and Water. And I know this lady from a meeting we had in Fort Pierre County over a year ago. Right. 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 That's right. That was a round table. It was a round table. Right, it was a round table. And, and I told her I was coming to visit her over a year ago, but I finally got here. So this is a great event. That was a long trip. That was a long trip. Well, thank you. Sam is one of our master gardeners, our extension master gardeners, who's engaged with working with low income communities and helping them to um, grow food. What do you think about that? We're looking for any opportunity. If anyone wants to get some assistance, we're ready to help them out. That's great. You know, Cooperative Extension has got a lot of really great resources for all gardeners everywhere. And uh, we've got soil testing services, we've got plant clinic services for people that want to need help with disease or insect identification. We've got public education and videos that are reserved and um, closed caption on the mgnv.org website. And uh, we have something, we have help for anybody that needs help.